Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate that, bud. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to bring them out today, especially. Uh, it won't be on the screen, but turn to Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. That's going to be our text. As we continue through looking through the incredible promises that we have in this book of Joshua for the people of God today. And the whole premise of what we're talking about, or I believe this book is, that God's promises are the foundation for a successful Christian life. When we understand what God has provided for us and we implement that and acclimate it to our everyday living, that is the pathway to the most successful, most fulfilling life we can live on earth. And there will be a life that brings glory and honor to our Heavenly Father. So with that in mind, let's look at Joshua chapter 14, verses 7 to 13. We're looking at promise number 10. I believe there's 11 specific promises that were given in this book. And promise number 10 is how God promises grace for the journey. He always gives us what we need when we need it. And how many of us have some areas of our life where we need God's provision? Okay. Well, what we're going to look at today shows us how to tap into God's grace or God's provision for whatever we encounter in this life. So Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. I'm going to read it, and as we do, I'm going to ask the Lord to bless his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we just pause and acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing. Your words are spirit. They are life. As Steve shared this morning, your word is alive and active. And we ask now that you would penetrate our hearts at the very core of our being, mold us and shape us into the men and women of you that you've destined us to be through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to apply and minds to understand. In Jesus' mighty name. Joshua chapter 14, starting at verse 6. It says, Then the sons of Judah, and I want to give a little bit of background. So at this point, Joshua has called all the people together. They divided the entire land of Israel up into the 12 tribes, their territories, and they were commissioned to go and possess fully the land that God had provided for them. And then we see this little snapshot in chapter 14 of one of the tribes, Judah, one of the men of that tribe who were going to fulfill that word and that commission. It was one of the sons of Judah. They, they drew near, near to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me, they focused on the wrong thing, and they made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I, I kept my eyes on the Lord and his immeasurable grace, and therefore I followed the Lord my God fully. Verse 9, so Moses swore to me on that day, saying, telling me a word that I knew came directly from God, that Moses was the spokesman, but God was the author. And here's what he said. Surely the land with which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord, my God, fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years. From the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses. And I want you to think about that for a moment. For 45 years, this promise that God gave him has been germin germinating and festering in his heart. And never did he doubt the day of fulfillment, the day would come when he would possess everything that God had prepared for him. He says, for 45 years I've waited, and I'm still as strong today as I was in the day of Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this hill country. Now's the day to step into the fulfillment of God's promise about which the Lord spoke to me on that day. For you heard that day the Anakin were there, the giants, the great sword fortified cities, and perhaps the Lord will be with me. Now we read that, and that's not a statement of 
condition. It's more a statement of faith. It could be expressed or more accurately expressed. As long as I have you with me by my side, I will drive out. I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So let's take a look this morning to find out what this has to say to our hearts and our lives in fulfillment of God's promise of giving us what we need when we need it to walk into the life that he's provided. And there's five things or five principles I believe that stand out that we want to highlight this morning. The first one is this, God's best is always available. Number two, God's grace must be activated. Number three, God's promises must be treasured. Number four, God's word must be trusted. And number five, God's word must be acted on. And that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. The first one is this, that if we're going to step into the provision that God has for us and maximize his grace in our lives or the experience thereof, we need to understand and believe with our hearts fully that God's best is always available. That's what verses 7 to 12 tell us. This event is a picture of God's grace. God providing for his people what they could never provide for themselves or otherwise possess. So let's take first and take a look at what grace is. Let's define grace. What is grace defined? Well, number one, grace is the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners. God's grace is seen in that he accepts us and receives us to himself because of what Jesus has done for us. He gives us what we don't deserve, relationship with him. But not only that, he bestows on us his blessings. Out of his goodness, out of the richness of who he is, he makes that available to those who put their hope and their trust in him. That's grace. We have the gift of salvation and we have the gift of the inheritance of God's character. And the treasury of God's presence. Great grace has been defined as God's resources at Christ's expense. We have more and more because of what Christ provides. And grace has God given us what we need. And I would say this, all that we need when we need it. And God's grace is free and available to all who will call upon the Lord. That's just what God does. He provides. And why this is important, why I want to take the time to reiterate that, and I want us to get the proper understanding of grace. In fact, you can't take advantage of God's grace. God is just too big to be taken advantage of. He's too smart for us. And why this is important, because of what it implies. You see, as the recipients of God's grace, that is what we are, we will never encounter anything in life that God hasn't already provided what we need to overcome. That's the benefit of grace. Because God is so gracious, we will never encounter anything. I don't know what you're up against today. I don't know what you're facing. I do know this, that God has already provided what you need to overcome it for his glory. That's grace. It doesn't matter what we face. God's already supplied what we need. We start with understanding that God's best is available because God is a gracious God. You see, as Christians, we have been hardwired and pre-wired in Christ for success. So God's grace is rooted in three fundamental truths. Why does this work? Well, number one, because God is faithful. One thing we can count on is the fact that God will be faithful. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you had on the screen, it would be there, but it's not. So if you have your Bibles, you can look it up later. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation, no trial, no hardship, no difficulty has overtaken you. You will not encounter anything in this world that isn't common to humanity. And then he says this. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able. That's the fact of God's promise. 
we will not encounter anything, he will not give us the grace to endure. He will, with the temptation, also provide a way of escape that we may be able to endure, go through it in a way that brings glory and honor to him and great joy and satisfaction to us. And I want us to hear the words and underline it. God will provide a way of escape. And I don't know what you're going through today, but I know this because God is gracious. God will provide a way of escape. That is who we who he is, it's what he does. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful, right? First, Second Timothy 2.13. When we are faithless, yet he remains faithful because that's what he is. God is faithful and he does not change. You see, faithfulness is who God is. And faithfulness is the opposite of fair weather. Thank God we don't have a fair weather God. He not only has what we need when we need it, he makes it available when we need it. So in him, we are never overmatched or underprepared. We can trust God. Here's the point. We can put our hope in God because God is gracious and God is faithful. We can stand upon that fact. And because of that, we can always expect God's best for our lives. And our families. Number two. God is faithful, but God is also true. He will be true. Numbers 23, 19 and 20 says this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He has said, or has he said and will not do it? When God said some, says something, he's going to perform it. Every single time. Or has he spoken and will not make good on it? Behold, I have received the command to bless and when he is blessed, I cannot revoke it. I cannot undo what God wants to do. He's bigger than we are. That's the point. Why can we expect God's best? Because he's bigger than we are and he's not like us. Amen. And I know that's the understatement of the year. But sometimes we act like we don't know what's true. But God is far greater than we are. And his ability to perform is unmatched in this world. In a few days, we'll be celebrating Easter. And the fact that God way outperforms anything we could ever think or imagine. You know, the disciples knew that God could do incredible things. They knew that there was no one on this earth like Jesus. To the point that they said, you are God. But they still couldn't understand the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And in that resurrection, I'm going to provide life eternally for you and everyone who puts their trust in me. And they're like, we don't really understand what he's talking about. What do you mean you're going to die? When you die, it's all over. He says, when I die, it's not all over. I'm going to rebuild this temple. I'm going to come alive again in physical form. You're going to see me. And when you see me, you're going to turn this world upside down because I'm going to radically change your life. God goes far beyond what we could ever think or imagine. Joshua 24, 20, 24, 21, verse 45. Sorry about that. It's wrong in your, in your notes there. But Joshua 21, 45 says this. Not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed, but all came to pass. That's the confidence we have in God. Everything he promises, he delivers. And I want to take a little time here and walk us through this. See, Galatians 6, 9 says, God will not be mocked. In other words, he has established laws for success. Live life his way, we win. That's a law. You cannot live life God's way, surrender to his will for your life, and lose. He who loses life for my sake will find it, is what Jesus said. And we cannot live life any other way, and win. If we live life any other way than the way that God has prepared for us, we fall short. We lose. God's not mocked. He's true. We apply his principles. We win. We don't. We lose. 
We can put our hope in God because God is absolutely true to his word. Not one of his promises will ever be unfulfilled. That's the hope we have in Christ. And that leads us to the third foundation of grace. And that is that God will supply all our needs. Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And I think we would be wise to often pause and remind ourselves and think about this. God will supply all my needs. How many times do we wander and vacillate back and forth and struggle with doubt? We only do this because we are questioning God's ability to perform his promise. If we're in a situation, God has promised what we need to get through it in a way that brings glory to him. Turn to him. We will never find ourselves with a need that is beyond God's infinite ability to supply. I remember going to college. And I don't know about you, but when I went to college, I wanted to be on my own. I wanted to provide for myself. And I remember going to the orientation, and they're going to do a financial workshop. And this is fresh in my mind. This past week, we went to my daughter's um, orientation, and they talked about what you will have to pay for her to go to college at California Baptist University. And you look at those things, and I remember, and the astronomical figures and reminded of God's ability and infinite supply to meet that need. If you just do what God's called you to do, he'll take care of it, and I believe it. And I remember when I was in college and I went, and my mom and dad were there, and they said, hey, we, we want to go with you to orientation. I said, mom, you know, I'm 18 years old right now. I, I, I can take care of myself. I'll go, and my mom's like, well, you don't want me to go to school with you? I said, no, I don't want you to go to school with me. Uh, I said, my dad's like, fine, you bring your own checkbook. I said, you guys can come, you guys can come. <laughs> you know, I, I want you to see the campus and everything. It's really, really nice there. And, and I was way in over my head. But we went, I had no idea what to expect, and we went there and sat down with them, and they started looking at your financial package and what you owe and all the different things. And they look at your scholarships, and I received a scholarship from our church, $1,000 for that. Hey, that can go towards Tuition was only $4,000 for the year. <laughs> a little bit different back then. And I remember they said, oh, you were in Bible quiz? I said, yes, I was in Bible quiz, and we had won our district for several years. And they said, wow, we've got this incredible benefit and scholarship for you. 100% of your tuition is going to be covered for four years. I said, Mom and Dad, you can go home now. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was like, wow. You know, and, and realizing, you know what, as much as I love my parents and we lean on our parents, but you know what, God's the one who meets the need and supplies way beyond what we could ever think or imagine. I remember God had a lesson for me in that moment at a very young age, studying to go into ministry. And he was telling me, Dane, I got this. I got this. Your parents, they're good and they're contributors. They don't got this. You definitely don't got this. But I got this. And I don't know what it is we're facing, but I know every single time we face it, God reminds us, wants to remind us, I've got this. I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. You turn to me, you look to me, and I'm going to walk you through. That's God's promise. He's gracious. He's faithful. He is true. He will supply our every need. Trust him. That's opening the spigot to God's best for our lives. Secondly, God's grace must be activated. So God makes his best available to us, but we don't all experience it. And we see that in the scriptures. We see that in the book of Joshua. God made it all available, but not all of them experienced God's best. Why? Because God's grace is set in motion as we take hold of and build our lives on his promises. Starts with getting a firm grip on truth. You want to experience God's best for your life? Then we need to get a good understanding and a firm grip on God's truth. Jesus says this, 
live in my word. That's a big one. <laughs> but, wow. Live in my word, and you'll know the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. You want to experience God's best? You want to walk into the full measure of his grace? Get a firm grip on his word and his truth. Here it is. We can't apply what we don't know. And I believe that's the big error of the church. We got DDD. We've heard of ADD, but I believe in DDD, doctrinal deficit disorder. We just don't know enough of what we have in Christ. So we need to keep it simple. We'll never understand everything there is to know in the scriptures. But I want to say this. We must learn what we have in Christ. We may not know everything, but what we do know needs to get a firm grip on the very fiber of our being. Learn what we have in Christ. The more we understand who we are and what we have, the more truth we can apply. A truth that sets us free. The more we understand or get a firm grip on God's truth, the more hope we'll possess naturally. Listen, when it's all said and done, read the end of the book. We win. <laughs> what are we all stressed out about? Remind yourself, get a firm grip on the truth. It doesn't matter what it looks like today. We don't live for this world. We live for eternity. And in the end, we win in him. So no matter what happens, we can celebrate and have great joy. And I would say this, enjoy the ride. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. It's going to work out in the end. Praise the Lord. You see, the more God's truth has a grip on our lives, on our hearts, and our minds, the more confidence we'll have in God on a daily basis. If God is for us, who can stand against us? We need to ask ourselves that on a regular basis. Listen, as I'm encountering this, if God's for me, what is this? Like David with Goliath, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? Challenging God. We need to approach our hardships and our temptation, our struggles with that. Who does this thing think it is compared to our God? And by all means, avoid the pitfalls of ignorance. Here it is. The less aware we are of what we really have in Christ, the more stunted our spiritual growth will be. The less we understand of the scriptures, the more stunted or restricted our spiritual growth will be. And can I tell you, when things don't grow properly the way they're supposed to, they look weird. Amen? When something's malnourished, it's, just, it's not getting what it needs, and it kind of tries to grow because it's designed to grow, and it just kind of looks weird. It's, it's a kind of shell of itself, right? And I wonder if that isn't a great picture of so many Christians. We've been stunted by our growth because God's word's not having the effect it's intended to have. And we're kind of, we just look weird. We're not growing properly. And the answer is to open the floodgates of God's word, get nourished by his word. And what happens, we begin to flourish and blossom and be everything God intended us to be. And it's the best picture of Jesus this world will ever see. God's word. You see, the more ignorant we are of God's word, the more doubts we'll have. The more we'll begin to question things that are Immutable or unchangeable. The foundation for godly living. The more fear will mess with our minds. You see, it's not just a matter of doubting God's word. Here's the point. When we doubt God's word, we're questioning his character. That's the point. When we doubt God's word, we're questioning his character. And I don't know about you, but I don't like when people question my character. Remember, I was a youth pastor, and I was at a church for 15 and a half years. And at one point, we had like 100 young people flocking around the campus and walking all over doing this or that. And, and it's hard to keep tabs on that many young people. And I remember one of the members of the church came to our senior pastor and said, Man, I was out on the church parking lot, and I heard a teenager cussing up a storm. And I don't think I should come to a church campus or church parking lot and hear people cussing. And so our pastor called me aside and 
said, I want to go for a walk with you. And I said, hey, somebody came to me and they're a strong member of this church. And they said they're upset because they went across the church parking lot and they could hear people cussing. And I don't want people cussing on our campus. Can you take care of that? I said, if you think that I'm inviting people from this community to come to this church so they can swear up a storm, you got the wrong youth pastor. <laughs> That's not what I'm here for. But we can't act and expect non-Christians to act like Christians. We're called to reach the unlost, and we're trying to get as many people as possible from our community to visit this camp and have an encounter with Jesus Christ that changes their life. And if you think I want them to come here and live it up for the devil, I'm not your man. That's questioning my character, my call. My belief is every single one of them, this is the one place in this world they're going to be encouraged to follow Jesus. They may not hear the gospel any other place. They're not hearing it at home. They're not hearing it from their friends. They're not hearing it on TV. The only place they're going to have the opportunity to respond to God's call to himself is right here. And I want as many people as possible to come. And if there's young people here today, if you've got young people, I want to encourage you. Every Thursday night at youth group, that's the one opportunity that every single week, They have the opportunity for God's word to be poured into their lives. And I want to encourage you at all costs, get them here. Give them a chance to have an encounter with Jesus that changes everything. That's why Sunday morning is so important. That we would take advantage every opportunity we get to sit down at the foot of the cross, the foot of God's word, and say, God, let your word get a hold of me and transform my life. That's it. We take full advantage of it. Avoid the pitfall of ignorance, of missing out on what God makes available on a regular basis. The price of ignorance is great. You see, the less we are aware of what we have in Christ, the less confidence we will have in God. And here's the point. When God's word and his promises are out of sight... They're out of mind. And when they're out of mind, they're out of play in our daily living. And that is a recipe for settling for less than God's best for our lives. And tragically, that's a picture of majority of the people of Israel. And Caleb said, not so with me. I'm going to follow the Lord with all my heart. I'm going to let his word get a firm grip on me, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to settle for anything less than the best that he's promised for my life and my family. And we would be wise to do the same. Number three, God's best is always available. God's grace is activated by uh, laying hold of God's promises. And number three, we learn that God's promises must be treasured by the man or woman of God, verses 6 to 12. And I think it would be a good exercise. I almost wish I could put this on the screen right now. But in these six, these seven verses, verses six through 12, a good question to ask ourselves is how many times does the writer use the personal pronoun? I, my, and me. If you were to look it up and read these seven verses, 23 times, I, me, my. Not counting in you. And I don't like to focus on us all the time because I think we're so much more successful when we focus on God. But there's a time to make sure we value a personal word from God. That's what we see in verses 6 to 12. That's what Caleb is a shining example of. Somebody who valued a personal word from God. Verse 6, you know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and concerning me. A word he treasured in his heart. He internalized God's word and never let it go for 40 years. I want you to think about that for a moment. 40 years he was given this promise, you're going to get the land. For 40 years, you're going to have a baby. For 40 years, you're going to get this job. And you're going to wait for 40 years. You're going to get this home, but you're going to wait for 40 years, day after day, 365 days a year. 
Caleb waited in an ex earnest expectation that God would fulfill his word because that's what God does. He internalized the word and he never gave up. He never let it go. And that's the sim two simple applications. Number one, we need to internalize the word of God. Yesterday I sat down with a group of men and talked about how we can grow in our leadership and our influence for the Lord. Talked about Hey, what, what's one thing in, over the past month that's been, God's been speaking to you? And one of the gentlemen says, you know what? I just, I've just sat back and said, I just want to, I want to, I want to read less, not more. I'm like, what? It's like, I, you know, sometimes when I read too much, it just, it, I forget everything. And so I just, God's been speaking to just to read a little, read less, but take in more. You know, internalize what I'm reading. Not reading for reading's sake. Not getting through books. Not checking off. Yeah, I read that chapter. Read that chapter. I, I want God's word to get inside my heart and change my life. It's like you got it. Take the time to let God's word sink in and settle into your heart. That's personalizing His word. When we read, we need to say, "God, what are you saying to me?" And then don't let it go. Don't let anything get you off of God's promise for your life. You know, I don't know everything there is to know in the scriptures. I wish I did. As a pastor, man, I, <laughs> I wish I knew everything. But what I do know, God has used to get a hold of my life. I can tell you that the single greatest resource for transformation in my life and my family has been God's word. What I do know, letting it penetrate and get a hold of me. In fact, if you ask me for counsel, we'll sit down. I'm, I'm going to tell you, well, here's what. I know God's word says. And whatever his word says, that's what we should do. We're going to be successful. I'm just not that smart to figure it all out. If you're going to be stubborn, how many of us are stubborn here? Wow, we've got a church of stubborn people. But if you're going to be stubborn, be stubborn about God's word. Be stubborn about what you get from God, not letting anybody take it away. God gave me this, and I am not going to be moved from it. No, that's what God said. That's what Caleb did. He internalized God's word, and for 45 years, he held on to it and never let it go. Don't let go of your God-given dreams. God is faithful. What he promises, he will fulfill. It's a personal word. Secondly, build your confidence in God's word. We must build our confidence in God's word. Caleb made a decision to trust God's word over the best laid plans man had to offer. He was confronted with man's wisdom and God's wisdom. He chose God's wisdom and that made him stand out. He says, you know what? Everybody else took what they saw when they spied out the land and they went the path of least resistance. Is that the world we live in? And he says, you know what? I'm not going to be like them. I'm not going to water down God's word. I'm going to take what God gave me, and I'm going to live my life in accordance with his word. I will do according to the word God gave me is in my heart. Some of us not but maybe aware, but several of Billy Graham's partners in crusades began to doubt God's word. When he first started out in ministry, he was traveling around the world. In fact, he took a little sabbatical because it nearly shipwrecked his own faith. But as his friends began to grapple with issues and began to doubt God's word, a couple of them said, I can't travel the word and I can't share a message I don't believe in any longer. And Billy Graham says he struggled intellectually with what the arguments they were presenting. And he said, I got away and got alone with God and said, God, is, is your word true? And what makes it true? And in his own words, he sat down and put God's word on a tree stump. Sat it down and says, you know what? I choose to take God's word as God declared it to be. Over 2,300 times, God's word is declared to be the word of God. He says, Lord, I, that's it. I may not have all the arguments, but I take it in faith. I trust you that this is the word you have given me. I may not be able to explain everything, but there's enough evidence. I can't waver from this conclusion. 
And that's where Billy Graham began to say, the Bible says. And he rested his hope and his confidence not in man's ideas, not in really cute sermons. He rested his success in ministry and fulfilling God's command for his life in this. The Bible says, I believe it, that settles it. Trust God's word. You see, when we see God's word for what it truly is, our lives can never be the same. In it, we're reminded of God's presence. In it, we're humbled by his power. In it, we're encouraged by his grace. In it, we are overwhelmed by his love. And in it, we are constrained by his purpose. God's word builds and strengthens faith. What does Romans say? What did Paul say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? By the word of God. You want God's word to have a stronger hold in your life? Listen to his word. Learn what it says and what it means. And then treasure it in your heart. Number four, God's word must be treasured. It must be, and number four, it must be trusted. It says he's going to follow God's word wholly. You see, when we allow God's word to set the course of our lives, he provides the power. When we set the course for our lives, we supply the power. And that is the difference between success and failure. Caleb held on to God's word for him for 40 years before experiencing the fulfillment of it. Actually, 45 years. And we're told, he says, I'm as strong at 85 as I was when I was 40. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I chuckled to myself. <laughs> I'm not as strong at 47. How old am I? 47. Yeah. As I was at 20 or 25, yet alone 85. I look at my dad. I said, yeah, I will be that strong. I will be that strong. <laughs> Just kidding, dad. He says, I'm, 80, I'm 85, and I'm as strong as I was at 40. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Where did his strength come from? His strength didn't come from his physical ability. It never did. His strength come from his confidence in God. I'm as strong today as I was then because God's word is as true today as it was then. And I'm counting on him. And what God says, he's going to do. He was as strong physically or up to the task, not because of his strength, but because of God's strength in him. That's what he's saying. You see, our greatest strength is in what God not only can, but wants to accomplish through us in his strength. I gave you some scriptures there. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You want to build the house of God? You're not going to do it in your own strength. You'll do it by his spirit. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when or after the Holy Spirit comes on you. So here's what I want you to do, Luke 24.49. I'm going to send the promise of my Father upon you, the Holy Spirit, but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Don't go anywhere until you receive what you need from me. So before we do anything... We must fill our spiritual tank. And I think that's a good word for the church today. Because we want to accomplish a lot of things. We want to do what God wants us to do. But we want to wait and allow him to fill us with his spirit. Fill us with his strength. Before we do anything, we must spill, fill excuse me, our spiritual tank. So we don't fizzle out over time. How did Caleb do this? He believed God's best was always there for the taking. No matter what giant stood in his way. Did you notice that he said that? The, the land that he was promised was actually the, 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 the place where the Yannick and the, the strongest ones were. He says it doesn't matter. Who are they up against God? He knew that if he continued in faithfulness to the Lord with all his heart, he could never lose. He made sure his spiritual connection stayed strong. That his spiritual life was constantly nourished and well fed. Because deep down, here's the point. He knew that if he walked close with God, his enemies had no chance. And that's a great takeaway for us today. If we walk close with God, 
our enemies have no chance. What a great way to look at life. And I think we've heard this so many times, it's become a cliche, but it still remains true. The biggest mountains we'll ever have to overcome isn't in the strength of our enemies, but in the resolve of our own faith and confidence in God. That's the biggest challenge. As long as we keep our eyes on Him, we'll never be tempted to throw in the towel. And as often as we take our eyes off Him, you better believe a full assault of temptations coming your way to quit and give up on God's best. Ultimately settle for something He didn't provide. And I asked this question this morning, are there any areas where we have settled for less than God's best? That wasn't good enough for Caleb. And I want to remind us it was good enough for his entire generation, but it wasn't good enough for him. And for God's sake, it ought not to be good enough for us. The answer isn't to fight harder. It's to stop fighting, to get our bearings in Christ, and resolutely follow the Lord with all our heart. And all this to say, God's word must be acted on. Verses 10 to 12. At some point, we got to take a step of faith. At some point, we got to take a leap of faith. He says, give me the hill country. It's time to leap. We will never possess the land or the life that God has purchased for us if we're unwilling to take a step of faith. At some point, we either step in the water or we're out in the cold. We apply it or we live on the outside of God's best. And I can tell you this, one thing we know from the scriptures is that God will always put us in positions that require us to depend upon him, to act as if what he says is true, is true. That's the only way to possess the land. And the principle is clear, and I close with this. It was true for Caleb, and it's true for each of us, that God's best is always available if we're personally willing to hang on to God's promises, if we treasure them in our hearts, if we take God at his word and take a step or leap of faith. Are we like Caleb, and no matter what our age, are we ready to possess the land that God has for us? Take away today, and if I could have the band come forward. You see it there in your notes that God has given us everything we need to do everything he's put in our hearts. What does God want to do through you? And I just want to pause for a moment, and I want you to think about that. And let's not think about the plans that we have for our lives. Let's consider the plans that God has for our lives. What does God want to accomplish through us? Because whatever that is, we have what we need to get it done. Ask him. Wait on him. Search the scriptures for the answer. Let him settle in your heart his truth, and from that shape your character. Then take whatever action steps are necessary to make his promises your everyday reality. If God is for us, who can be against us. And may God's best always be yours. Let's all stand.